Welcome back to the second core stream of this week. So we had just started to talk about Yosano Akiko and I want to remind ourselves of the kind of questions we want to ask ourselves as we approach that travelogue of hers. So to what degree is the work a product of the language and culture that produced it, that is 1920s Japan? What kind of image does it project of the cultures or countries she is traveling to? What larger socio-historic phenomenon is the work responding to or a product of? And finally, what ultimately motivated the act of traveling? And a little bit more specific, why did a Japanese female writer travel to China in the 1920s? Right? This is our first female writer in this class. Why did she write an account about what she experienced? What kind of account? How does her work differ from readings of previous weeks in terms of focus, style, audience, depiction of women, other ethnic groups? What can her work tell us about 1920s Japan, China, the world? What kind of picture or maybe even critique does she paint of her times and the places she visits? What about politics? What about the concept of Orientalism? And how do we as 21st century travelers react to her accounts and to what degree and to what degree does what happened during the pacific war that is after japan really enters into that full-fledged war with china and later the u.s and the world influence our judgment of her account from 1928 so one more word about the context of the times so by the time Yosano Akiko and her husband travel to China, Manchuria is still largely controlled by the Fengtian clique, which was one of several opposing military factions that constituted the early Republic of China during the so-called warlord era. And the South Manchuria Railway territory through which they traveled really was lease territory. It was not yet a colony. The area controlled by the Fengtian clique is usually referred to as Manchuria, was led by Zhang Zolin, a warlord, also known as the Old Marshal, who was backed by Japan and who played a very important political role in the 1920s. So if you're interested in that, you can look him up. Now, when his power weakened and the economy of Manchuria collapsed in the late 20s, he was actually killed by a bomb planted by the Kanto army. And that assassination was in part driven by the hopes of the Japanese that his son, who was a womanizer and an opium addict, and who was called Zhang Xueliang, also known as the Young Marshal, would be easier to manipulate. However, to everybody's surprise, he became a staunch supporter of the Chinese cause and resisted the Japanese. So again, if you're interested in that, you should look him up. And it's only later in the early 30s that Manchuria, all the territory was eventually occupied by Japan. And eventually they established a short-lived puppet regime called Manchu Guo. So they actually founded a new country and they put an emperor nominally in charge of that country. And that emperor was actually the last emperor of the Qing dynasty. There's a wonderful movie about that called The Last Emperor, and I recommend you to watch it if you want to learn a little bit more about that history. Now, what is interesting is that our travelogue by Yosono Akiko actually refers to some of these events implicitly. On page 27, she writes, readers may be shocked by our extravagance, but before leaving the hotel, I had changed some Japanese money into Feng Tian bills. So, right, the territory controlled by the Feng Tian clique had its own currency called the Feng Tian dollar. 50 yuan in Feng Tian currency on today's market had fallen to less than 2 yen. But let's look at the beginning of the travelogue. She writes that on the morning of the 16th of May 1928, Mr. Kato Ikuya, my husband and I boarded an express train on the main line of the South Manchuria Railway and departed from Dalian. So you have a map here on the left, you have the main trunk line in red, and you have an image of the train station at Dalian, a train, a departing train there from the South Manchuria Railway Company, connecting with the steamer that had just arrived 
from Japan. When we arrived at the Jinzhou station, the station master was kind enough to provide us with a young Chinese railway porter who could speak Japanese as our guide. We all boarded a horse-drawn coach and set out first to visit battlefields of the Sino-Japanese and Russo-Japanese wars in nearby Nanshan. I had mentioned that her younger brother had passed away during the Sino-Japanese war, which is probably why she wanted to visit those battlefields. And she actually wrote a very moving poem about her brother, which to this day Japanese school children all have to study, and it's really an anti-war poem and it's very moving. And if you want to read it, you can pause the video for a second here, but we should move on and see what else she experiences. So she writes, we passed through the gate of the city into Jinjo, and there for the first time I saw the Chinese city encircled by the city walls. One can really see how different the Chinese term for city, cheng, is from the Japanese conception of that same term, pronounced shiro, meaning castle or castle town. This was a city that had taken shape on the site of the ancient capital of Liaodong. The bustling scene seemed to be limited to the central street, although opulent merchant homes and massive residences of the elite formed a thick wall along a side road. My husband wrote down his impressions of the central street in his diary as follows. Rising clouds of white dust, a stench seemingly caused by food, the shadows and cacophony of men and horses, the pavement was sunken with wheel ruts. Now, it's really interesting how she focuses again and again on Chinese and Japanese cultural similarities. There's also a realization that the two countries have evolved in different ways. And of course, we see this again and again, there is an exotization of China, of this very different place. What else does she tell us? One of the public schools that had been established at the various sites by the South Manjura Railway Company for the education of the Chinese was outside the city walls of Jinzhou. So very interesting. She at times portrays the South Manjura Railway Company as a company almost on a civilizing mission, building schools, providing services for the local population, which in a way almost appears as if she's trying to legitimize the imperialist ambitions of Japan, bringing learning, bringing civilization to these people. At the same time, we again and again find this desire to study ancient China. We read, we visited a certain Japanese teacher at this public school and he took us to see the famed Tianqi Shrine outside the Eastern Wall. The shrine is also famous for the sculptures located in a detached hall depicting various aspects of hell. Although these are works of the Qing era and of no particular artistic value, there was one of ironic design. And then she describes it. But what is really interesting is she then says the creation of such sculptures and paintings as an aid in exhortations to believe is a rather old Buddhist technique. We find them as early as in the poems of hungry spirits in the Manyo Shu collection of 10,000 leaves, very important Japanese literary work. So again, she connects Japanese early civilization to ancient Chinese civilization, right? This attempt at seeing ancient China essentially also as the cradle of Japanese civilization, but it's limited to the ancient period. The idea of locating Japan's antiquity in China and studying it and recording it and collecting it. So we see many examples of that. My husband opened a book sitting on the table in the guest quarters, right? They're staying at this temple and found that it was the Jing Gang, Jing Ru Shuo Zhu, an annotated commentary on the Diamond Sutra published in the Daoguang 26 of the Qing dynasty. Although not an ancient edition, the style of the commentary was extraordinary and my husband told the steward priest that he would like to purchase it. The priest could not sell it, but said if he so wished, he would give my husband the work as a present. So my husband was only too happy to accept it. As compensation for these, my husband donated a piece of gold to the temple. So at least he paid for it. Of course, you might say it wasn't really up to the priest to sell this ancient treasure. This opens a whole other can of worms. But for now, let us emphasize the fact that there was this real interest by these Japanese to study ancient China, collect it, and to record it. I remind you of that passage 
where they meet this archaeologist, right? Mr. Kato pointed out to us the ancient graves that just a few years ago, Professor Tori Ryozo had excavated. Tori was touring Manchuria and Mongolia at the same time as we were, and we later learned that about a month after he visited this area, he had discovered Nestorian crosses from a successful dig in the tombs in this area. So again, the South Manchuria Railway Company also funded archaeological digs, which again very much mirrors the way Europeans undertook the self-appointed task of becoming guardians of antiquity in these places. Another interesting aspect is how Yosano Akiko engages with the question of how Japan developed, settled, and really exploited these new colonies. Look at this passage from page 16 to 18. We first paid a call by car on the agricultural experimentation station operated by the South Manchurian Railway. After listening to gracious explanations by the staff and inspecting various reference specimens of their work, we were able to get a general conception of the produce distinctive to northern and southern Manchuria. We next returned to the Agricultural Experimentation Station and with the kind guidance of the agronomist there, we observed specimens of things produced in Manchuria. Grains, vegetables, fruits, silk, and cotton and flora and fauna. We also saw the plants and seedlings on a huge farm and were given an object lesson on the spot. There were various sorts of sorghum and over 40 different varieties of beans. And on page 26, we could see mountains close at hand on both right and left. At a slight distance removed to the left, we could see a bald mountain in reddish brown. It was one of the mines at Anshan where the South Manchurian Railway Company was excavating iron ore. So you see how the South Manchurian Railway Company is engaged in all these different commercial enterprises and how they're actually actively studying, for example, which types of produce work best in different parts of the colonies. So again, very similar to what, for example, the British East India Company was engaged in. We talked about how they planted rubber in Malaysia, which originally was native to Brazil, right? So the Japanese colonial project engages in many similar activities and Yosano Akiko, interestingly, in her travelogue, actually comments on a lot of these activities. Now, who was doing all this? Well, she also tells us that. Because it was so convenient to travel along the trunk line of the railway, the Japanese living in Manchuria frequently came from north and south to enjoy the baths here. She talks about these hot springs, right? And we learned that a lot of those Japanese settlers actually take advantage of them. We get off the train at Tangangzi station on the main line of the South Manchurian Railway and put up at a hotel by the Tangangzi hot springs in front of the station. The hotel was indirectly managed by the South Manchurian Railway Company, its structure immense in scale and its proprietors scrupulously attentive to conveniences within. So the South Manchuria Railway Company puts up this immense infrastructure, but essentially serves mainly Japanese settlers and the colonial elites. And then there's an interesting passage. She writes, in the park where the Liao Yangshintu Shrine and the South Manchurian Railway Club both built by the Japanese. Only a few days earlier, the lower floor of the club had been used as billeting for infantrymen dispatched unexpectedly from Korea. Japanese infantrymen, probably of the Kanto army. The officers and soldiers who came and went appeared in an excited state, as though a war was commencing. Imperialism and the smell of liquor rippled through, and the atmosphere of this inn became thoroughly incompatible with our desire to write poems about the gentle white pagoda and the willow catkins. We entered a poorly lit room in a corner of the lower floor and for a time could not even bring ourselves to open our bags and change clothes. This is really interesting, I find. We have to ask ourselves, is Yosano Akiko blind to the imperialist reality? Right? She almost criticizes those Japanese soldiers who come there and make so much noise and they drink and they disturb this romantic fantasy that she and her husband had come to find in Manchuria. Right? So almost right, like Hermann Hesse complaining about these British churches in Singapore because they somehow disturbed this beautiful image that he had had of the East. Right? So we have to ask ourselves, is she sort of idealizing China in the same way 
without wanting to see the cruel reality of imperialism. Of course, she is similarly blind to other cruel realities that really are a product of imperialism. Let's look at that passage about the opium dens. Mr. Wakabayashi also took us to see an opium den. It was located along a narrow alley crowded with brothels and eateries. The brothel next door was a small house with one door and a single room. The sight of a prostitute between 14 and 20 years of age standing in the door beckoning to potential customers was too painful to watch. By moderating and eventually bringing an end to opium smoking, the authorities actually allowed opium use, which they then taxed as a source of revenue for the Fengtian government. In recent years, Zhang Zuolin had been compelling farmers in the northeast to cultivate opium for the same reason that he could extract a heavy tax on it. That was true, but of course it was really the Japanese who controlled, who controlled the opium trade, who tolerated it precisely because it could be so heavily taxed. And this, of course, is just as bad as what the British did, right? That whole evil that started back in 1841 after the first opium war. The Japanese are really copying that model. And of course, the fact that she wanted to visit an opium den, and we see a Japanese postcard here on the right of an opium den, is really nothing other than a process of exoticizing the use of opium. So again, it really seems that she's oblivious to Japan's imperialist conduct and the exploitation of the local population and their land and instead continues to eulogize and search for a China of a distant past, a China that maybe only exists in her imagination. So she writes, this truly harmonizes with the atmosphere under the crystal clear blue sky of Manchuria, which gets so little rain with its aroma of late spring, early summer sun and fresh leaves. It all renders the mind graceful and lucid. Sweeping over the cart in which we were traveling, they scattered about us repeatedly. They is the willow catkins. We were so happy to be able to see for the first time here those things known as willow catkins in Chinese literature. My husband cited a poem by Wu Rong, a poet from the Tang period, and then said, I now understand the joy of this poem. Somehow the willow catkins seem to love the wind and they seem to be loved by it. I penned a poem that follows. The day south of the city, riding in the horse-drawn cart with the teacher from Jinjo, the willow catkins scattered over us. Now, before I end today's lecture, I just want to remind us that despite everything, despite Japan's imperialist ambitions, the interwar years were also a period of very close and fruitful cultural contacts between China and Japan. Many Chinese writers, intellectuals and politicians continue to study in Japan and many Chinese writers travel to China because they really were interested also in meeting Chinese writers. One example is Tanizaki Junchiro whose travel account I also put up on iLearn under optional readings. So if you're interested in that, please take a look. And then there were visionaries like Uchiyama Kanzo, who opened a bookstore in Shanghai and who was close friends with a lot of Chinese intellectuals, like, for example, Lu Xun. And sadly, this close and fruitful cultural exchange really came to an end as Japanese militarists and ultra-conservative forces continued their imperialist project in China and elsewhere in Asia. But I look forward to reading your responses about Akiko's travelogues and I will see you again next week.